Hello, and welcome to this interview with myself, Deborah Henson Conant, and Eveline Huber. We are going to be playing together with the Salzburg Philharmonic October 7th and 8th. And we got some interview questions, and we thought, what would it be like if we interviewed each other? So these interview questions are specifically from Alex at Camac Harps, and we both play Camac Harps. So we wanted to get started with this, and we wanted to share it with everybody on Facebook. So, Evelyn, um, what is your what is your first question for me, and then I'll ask you the same question. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm very honored to be here, to be on your channel, to work with you, and uh, we had a lot of fun already to work out this program, which we play soon together in Salzburg, and I'm very happy to, that you came over. And my question, yes, I prepared a few questions, so you want to start with my personal own questions, or you want to start with the Kamak questions? Well, honestly, Alex. actually, to be honest, I would love to hear your story of how you, well, first of all, how you came to play the harp, and second of all, how you started to get interested in playing a different kind of music, and third, how you first connected with me. Right, that's a story, I tell you. So I grew up at a farm here in uh, Germany, in the southern part of Germany, in Bavaria, and uh, don't ask me why, but I got a, um, a piano as I was six years old, which is very rarely for um, for farmers' children. So I got uh, I got piano lessons as I was six years old, and then we made um, folk music in our family, so traditional Bavarian folk music. And uh, in in the era I live, we have a smaller uh, a smaller pedal harp. So it's not the big concert grand harp. It's a little bit smaller. It has also pedals, but it has just seven pedals and one step so it's a single action pedal harp and um, I was nine years old and my sister she had the idea oh a harp would be nice to have in the group so one two three four you learn the harp and I was a very brave child and said yes if you say so so I learned the harp <laughs> and I took harp lessons and then a few years later exactly uh, the same sister I have two sisters she married a musician and uh, my brother-in-law, he was also into world music, improvising, a little bit jazz influenced. And he realized that this little girl, I was 14, 15 already, um, there is a talent for music. And we played in groups together and I started to play um, also improvising and um, jazz music and I met a harpist here in the south of Bavaria. Her name is Ushila and she already played um, American rhythms and improvising and I took lessons from her. So and then a few years later, I was 17, <laughs> sweet 17, I attended at a workshop with an American jazz harpist. And I went there and I was completely thrilled. And I, I remember the situation, I came home, uh, at this time I had a, a pony, a, a horse, and I was riding with my horse and I couldn't stop to, to groove and snip at my fingers. I was so full of this uh, music and it was you, yeah? I, we don't say the year of the, of the meeting, but it is uh, a while ago. So, and this was really the, the point where I knew I want to be harpist, but um, I think uh, orchestra is not my way. I want to do my own stuff and I want to do such cool things like I heard from you. Yes. So that was a, a little story now. <laughs> it was really fun to hear your story. I've never heard that whole story. And what I loved about it was watching the parallels between us that I didn't know. So when I was a little girl and I was seven, um, my parents always sang and my mother played the ukulele and I always wanted to play the ukulele because it was so amazing to think that somebody could accompany themselves to sing. And so when I was seven, my, my mother let me play the ukulele and she taught me three chords. And I still remember that moment of making the chords with my hands and realizing that making patterns on these strings 
created music. And I only had to learn three patterns in, in order to be able to play all the music that I knew, really, because I was a little kid. And so I grew up um, playing folk songs and singing folk songs. And I also lived with my grandmother on a farm. So my, my parents divorced and I moved around, but one of the places, every, every, one thing that all my relatives had was a piano, always a piano. And I was allowed to play that piano as if it were a toy. So yes, again, on this farm with cows and mostly cows and, um, and mostly more cows, there was also a piano. And my grandmother's piano was a player piano. So I got very interested in all the mechanical things of like, and which was which was what interested me in the harp. I didn't start the harp until I was, I, I had a couple of lessons, I think when I was about 16, because I was interested in music. I was playing music all the time, but I didn't like lessons. And my parents kept thinking, well, let's try the guitar and here's a great teacher and um, let's try the piano. But I wasn't doing well with lessons. And so they were like, aha. We'll borrow a harp. We'll give her a harp lessons. She's got to be interested in that. And um, I took a few harp lessons and I really was fascinated by the mechanics of the harp, but I didn't like lessons. And I think after that, they realized, oh, I see. She loves music. She wants to know how it works. She doesn't want lessons. So they stopped trying to give me lessons. And I just started composing and writing music, musical theater. But I had that memory of the harp. And when I became an adult and my college needed a heart player, a few times along the way, I got a chance to take some lessons. And then when I was 22, I got very serious about the heart. And at that point, <clears throat> I, was, I was ready to sit down and start learning. And one of the things that I loved was once again, patterns on strings. And I began to see that the harp has, it's so powerful the way it's built. That, that, that patterns on strings make this huge amount of music as opposed to the ukulele where patterns on strings make something very small. And so I started playing classical music and then I realized I felt constrained. And so I started playing jazz and then I felt a little more constrained. And so I started writing my own music. And then I was invited to come to the Edinburgh Harp Festival to teach the harp players there how to play the blues. And when I went there, a woman named Nancy Tim Hochrein, who was a, an American living in Germany, invited me to come and do a workshop. And this was the first time I'd done, I think, a week-long workshop in a very unusual place. I think it was almost like a cloister or something. And at that workshop, Ushilar was there. And I think that's where I also met you. So that is where our worlds collided. And then... Yeah. And then you actually came and studied with me in the US. Right, this was about 12 years later. But I wanted to ask you, because I want to make a, a step uh, um, back. Um, how did you get all your knowledge meant about uh, blues and jazz? What was your, uh, who influenced you musically in general at this time in your life? A couple of things happened. So I grew up hearing the American songbook, hearing, you know, Girl from Ipanema and playing it on the piano, hearing musicals, all the classics, all the, um, you know, Irving Berlin, George Gershwin. I grew up wanting to be George Gershwin combined with Leonard Bernstein, um, combined with, you know, a superhero, woman superhero. That was my idea of who I wanted to be. So I grew up that way and I started writing music and I started trying to understand how it worked. Um, so my knowledge of music really came from mostly a, a very few lessons. So I remember my mother took me to a jazz teacher because she saw, saw that I wanted to improvise. And I remember her saying to him, um, he, he wanted me to do some stuff and, and, and she said, she's not gonna practice. So can you, can you just tell her how it works? She's, if you tell her to do something, she's not gonna do it. So just tell her how music works. And I remember him just looking at her like, what are you talking about? No, she's gonna have to practice. And she said, she's, she's, not, gonna, she's not gonna do it. So don't ask her to. So um, 
I think everybody just gave up and they just let me play. So mostly I discovered, but it's quite easy to discover because I was taught the basics, which is, and I wonder if I can, I don't know if I can do this on the harp and it, it might start buzzing, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, you can build a chord and it's really easy to see on the harp. I learned it on the piano, but you just build a chord by making, you know, there are seven notes, but you do every other one to build a chord. So one of my favorite chords is this D minor chord, because you can do a th every other note. You just start on D, you play every note, all the white keys, and it makes this beautiful chord. And it was explained to me that this was the one, the three, the five, the seven, the nine, the 11, the 13. And so there it all was, it's just boom, there it is. You've got the numbers and then you start moving the numbers around because this is the one, but that's the two of this one. You know, it, it was just sort of playing around. And then because I was always playing music and I loved the sound of sevens. <laughs> And I started learning I shit. What? I have to change the, the, the output of the harp. The, the oh, is it very the loud or is it very soft or is it what? Yeah, it's just oh, 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 I see what's happening. Okay. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't have this. So yeah, I didn't have the, it's set. So you couldn't hear it at all, right? Okay. All right. So, um, I don't know what you did hear and what you didn't hear, but, um, oh yeah. So, um, just this, every, every other string, I, I began to understand that the, f the function there was you have seven strings, you can play or seven notes in an octave. You can play them in order, but they don't do anything. They don't, they don't activate each other. But when you play every other one, they start to somehow activate each other. And as you keep doing that, um, it, it starts to build, build this sound. And so I think, I mean, I was just told that's how it works. You know, that's how it works. You build them in thirds, you keep building them. And then I began to understand their shapes. You know, I could take this shape very shape and move it around and I was doing that on the piano but then I learned to do it on the harp and then I started getting lazier and so I noticed that this shape if I kept one shape and I just moved the other suddenly I had a richer harmony and then I could sing along so I could make my own And I could make a musical at any moment. You know, so, so for me, it was just a way to, it was a way huh, for the world to be outside the way it is inside with music for everything. Say. So that was, that was, you know, all it was for me was to make the outside world like the inside world, having, having a song for everything. And then little by little, you know, I began to just explore how does this work? Then I did get interested in jazz. And mainly the reason I got interested in jazz is I, I started thinking, mm, I mean, jazz on the harp. I had this boyfriend who loved jazz. And I said, do you think I could play jazz on the harp? And he said, no, you can't do it. And so then I was like, <laughs> fine, I'm gonna do this. And the very first thing I decided to play was Stella by Starlight. And it was impossible. I mean, I tried to play Stella by Starlight and Girl from Ipanema, which you know are two <laughs> really hard things. to. Like, and I thought, well, I should be able to play these because I can play them on the piano. It took me a long time to figure out that there are things that are simpler to start with on the harp, which is how I teach so, now. Yeah. 
what were you going to say? You, you, you played a double action harp at this point, right? Correct, right. But and still. The girl from Ipanema is da, 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 Right, da, right, da, right. Da, I know. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, exactly. Something that, something that was so easy to do on the piano, which was to go bum, bum, on the harp is like bum, <laughs> bum. <laughs> And for anyone You're who's right. not a harpist, for anyone who's not a harpist, you can kind of see it here. Um, if I were to do this, it, it's like if I were to go. Oh, let's see, if I were to go, does my head still have this on? <laughs> You'd have to do that. <laughs> that's how to do something that's just so easy on the piano, but harder on the harp. But getting those Latin rhythms, that was something that was just always, um, it was my vocabulary and I wrote and I wrote in Latin rhythms as well, which that was very hard because I remember trying to write things down as a child and realizing that it was so difficult because I was always writing bossa novas. And if you try to write those in regular music, you're constantly creating, you know, um, tied notes, but there's all these syncopations. So that, and that was, realize, what? Did you realize at this, this point that you are a pioneer uh, for the harp? Because uh, no. there are so many changes before, besides of, uh, of course, uh, Dorothy Ashby or Harpo Marx. Who or, and, Cor and Corky Hale. I mean, there really was, there, there, there was a history of jazz harpists for sure, going all the way back, you know, way back. Um, I wasn't thinking about being a pioneer. I was thinking about the fun. I was thinking about that jazz opens me up to play with other people. Um, and I was thinking, um, it was just a challenge that I really wanted and it was already a vocabulary that I, that I had. And I know I did not think about the pioneering of it, um, but I did get a grant from the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, to go study with Corky Hale, which was great. I had, I had wanted to wow. study with either Corky Hale or, or Dorothy Ashby and um, Dorothy had gotten really sick right then and so I got the chance to study with Corky Hale, which was great. And she was the one, when I went to study with her, she said two things that were really, really important. One was, it sounds so simple, but she said, just make sure the melody is always clear. You can be as creative as you wanna be, but never lose sight of the fact that the melody must be heard. Because I would start getting creative right from, creative, I would start getting obtuse from the very moment I would start playing. And she was like, you can go there, but first let people hear the tune. So that was one thing she said. The other thing she said, and this really changed me. And I think if you look at me, you can see how that changed. She said, when you walk out on that stage, let people see that you're gonna do something different from the second you step on the stage. Wear something different. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to dress like a harpist and then surprise them. But eventually I began to understand just how right she was. And then I began to learn from touring and playing with orchestras. Um, I think it was Marvin Hamlish who said, when you come out on stage, the first thing to do is something that sounds to people like a harp. And then you can go into the, the, the more innovative things. So I would come out on stage and I would just go like And people were like, well, is this a guitar? Or is it a harp? And I learned to come out and first something really harpy and then so so little by little along the way I got such great 
advice and coaching, either, you know, Corky was probably the only harpist I studied jazz with, but from everybody else that I worked with, I got to learn from them. Isn't it like uh, you can learn so much more even from p pianists or from guitar players? It's so interesting to work with uh, non-harpists to develop maybe an own style and then yes. not only try to copy something. So this is my experience, which uh, was very helpful. And also yeah. to, um, to, to play on stage with a group so that there is this point, okay, in one minute, in half a minute, I have to improvise. And so right. on the stage, you have to come to the point where you, you have to catch the people. Yeah, I, think... I like this. I like this. This is excuse me. This description that uh, first you have to play something which sounds like a harp, so you have to catch the audience and then you can do whatever you want. Isn't right. It like that? Yeah, well, you have to meet them where they are. You have to meet them in what they know a harp to be and then take them take them from there. And and I, I studied with physical, physical people too, like a, a, a mime and other physical comedians who taught me other things that I haven't even implemented yet, but things like walking out on stage and literally, you know, touching the harp so that people see, you know, like just physicalizing my relationship with it first before even playing. All these different things, because we get so used to the fact that we play the harp and we forget this is an unusual, this is unusual. And how can we bring people in instead of just like, bam, you know, here's this new thing. It's like to not, to not downplay what they love. And it was, it took me a long time to feel safe. Hmm. these are longer stories, but to feel safe doing simple things like, like to incorporate um, folk music or, or to be willing. It was, it, it took me a long time to be willing to play. Oh, daddy boy. The pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen. You mean like, I mean, that was terrifying to me to play something that I thought might make me look like not this wild, you know, innovative person, but to play something that wow. meant, what, what were you going to say? But your version, uh, your version is attaching. I mean, there are a few uh, versions of Danny Boy, of course, which uh, is for a musician hard to, to, to listen to because there, that, there does not happen really m much, pretty much. But this is um, this your interpretation. Yeah, you can play just a scale and it's uh, it sounds beautiful. So this is um, a, a big quality for a musician that you really can play a few things and just, just reach the heart of the audience. Yeah, Very yeah that's, that's really interesting that you're saying that. And I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about the concert that we're, that we're doing because we're doing a concert together, 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 and with the, with the um, Salzburg Philharmonic. And so we are walking into an environment in which people have a lot of expectations of what they're going to hear. And, and I mean, I guess this is different than, than what you're saying, but this, this idea of how do we meet the audience in the place that they think is beautiful, that they find beautiful and that they find safe and then take them to new worlds as well, both with the symphony and also with our playing. And, and you're right. I mean, there, there, any, any piece of music can be trivialized. And I think some, you know, that's happened with tunes like Danny Boy, but also any piece of music can be the, the heart of the harmony and the richness of the harmony and the richness of the meaning can be explored no matter what the piece. 
and that's but also the fact go on we yeah a little, a little so <laughs> i'm sorry uh but also the the point that um you're not uh, the audience is not familiar with every side the harp has so um, right. i like the, the fact as a musician that you still can surprise the audience with sides of the harp they never heard before yeah and i think at our concert they will hear uh, maybe sides of the harp that they would never expect to hear yeah yes yeah and you're saying sides which i totally agree with and i'm also thinking it's it's almost like a dimension it's like taking someone into a different dimension and i don't know about you but for me i i have forgot this because you know i've been at this place you know to me there's nothing to to strum the harp okay to strum the harp or to play blues you know to play um to do like or, that 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 doesn't that's not oh whoops sorry i need to turn this oh, wait a minute is it on okay so to do this that that's not that's nothing new to me but i get that it's new for the audience nor is it new to me to do you know that that that's just like part of the vocabulary and for you since you have a soundboard you're going to be using the harp as a drum as well as using it for a harp and that's nothing new for us but you're right it's new for others and what you're making me think about is it was new for me at one time too it was a discovery each of these things i had never heard before maybe i'd heard a guitarist do it but i had never heard a harpist do it and i think that's one of the exciting things about being a, a pioneer is that you you get to have that moment of discovery of like wait a minute oh my god because i remember the moment in which i i saw the soundboard i was i was tired i was packing up after a gig i think it was in berlin or something and otmar liebert Nuevo Flamenco was playing over the sound system and I looked at the harp and I saw I heard him playing some kind of, you know, wooden drum and I looked at the harp and I realized that the soundboard I just had this like, "Oh my god. The, there here's this huge part of the harp that I've been thinking is invisible, isn't even there." But there it is. So literally for me it that the soundboard wasn't even a room in my house in my creative house and then suddenly it was this huge possibility and it could happen because you had not this um corset in your head this classic harp corset this is possible on harp or this has to sound like a harp or not so you could you ha you had the freedom to go all these ways yeah which is not right not common for, for our instrument maybe but it opens it up now that the newer generation is more open-minded uh, so they knew all this kind of different uh, sounds of the harp and i like yeah. so much that it's, it's yeah i wonder what that's like i mean you're you're right i didn't have i didn't hear harp music i didn't listen to recorded music as a child i never listened to recorded music so i had no idea i mean i kind of knew what the harp was but i didn't know so you're right. It was all exploration for me and I also felt like, well, how come I can't do that? How come the drummer can do that? How come, you know, how come the flamenco guitar has this and I don't have that? I don't get it. So there was this this like, hey, wait a second. But what was it like for you? So you were so the generation now has grown up hearing all of these sounds and all these possibilities and even this harp exists for them. And you're in the middle generation where you know where I was exploring these and playing with them and then you were hearing me do it, right? And then that opened yeah. up possibility for you. Right. So I knew that I I want to go through the the classical study because um 
I wanted to, to have all this knowledge, man. I wanted to stand next to a classical harpist and to know what they are talking about. So I had a big, uh, um, I, I, had a, I had a teacher in my university. She was very open-minded and she sent me um, after two years studying classical music to Carol McLaughlin to Arizona because she was classical trained uh, professor at the U of A but also she did a lot of jazz stuff. And then I came back and did my diploma and my master degree. And during all these times, I, I jammed with class uh, with uh, jazz music musicians. And um, so um, I knew that I have to do my own stuff. I, I, I knew that there is something I have to develop my own style. And there is the influence from you, the influence from uh, Ushila, the influence from um, Carol McLaughlin, and um, I put everything together in a big pot and uh, tried to make my own thing. This, well, this, more, this is yeah. Totally I mean, that's great, and that's I think exactly what you want to do. And it's so great that you. I did not realize that you'd worked with Carol McLaughlin, and she really was sort of the um, missing link between you know the classical player and and teaching jazz. But in but in sort of a how do you call it a a, um, a curriculum based situation. Um, so it, so what was beautiful about what she did is that it was very structured. That was my sense of it. I don't know if that's what it was like studying with her, but that that was my sense. And um, and then Ushilar, who was really you know I don't know her too well but I know that she was you know about freedom and about you know opening up and about there was this and then there was me exploring you know whatever I was exploring and I know that you came I what I love and I think this is really fascinating for anybody who wants to be doing something like this I mean we each came to different teachers I did not go to harpists because there were no harpists aside from Corky Hale for me to go to and Jack Nebergall, there were a couple. So I ended up going to a mime. I ended up going to, you know, um, wh wh whoever I could find freedom from. And then you came and you, you know, it's almost like you curated your own creative pathway. After my classical study, I knew I have to meet you again. And I asked you, this was, this is already over 20 years ago. And I asked you, can I have lessons? And you, you helped me um, in, in your neighbor house. I got a place to stay. I got a harp from you and we worked about two months together. And maybe you came just for 10 minutes or for half an hour. And this was great. This was a great experience because um, we sat together and, and you played and we tried also to analyze maybe what you're doing broken sixth chords or something and we recorded everything and this was a, a great way to learn i i still have the recordings actually oh my god i yeah. would love to i would love to see those sorry i'm having trouble with my ear here yeah that is my favorite way to to teach one-on-one -on -one is and i'm i've got it set up so that well, I, I had it set up before the pandemic but then there was a pandemic so that now people can actually live with me like like you did, except for you lived around the corner because you're right that it doesn't come in one hour or 30 minute segments. Some days you only needed 10 minutes to know how to get from here to there. And then you could go and you could play for two days or three days with that new idea. And then you could come back and get a little something else and then come back like and that's how it worked right 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 that was the way yeah right just little impulses and then to de develop and develop go and play over and over maybe also this is a secret to take little things and play over and over until it develops to something new yeah right yes and it, it's interesting it's funny that you say that about the six because i started in the academy now in hip harp academy training partly through classes partly through quarters where we focus on power of pattern or the structure is freedom but also every week giving people what i call snippets just like what you said some little tiny idea like okay you can you you have a 
this is a note and you can have a sixth above it. And once you have that, that particular interval, you can move it around. And, and it's, like, it's like having an echo following you or having harmony following you. So this one idea of the sixth, and then you can, of course, break it. And once you can break it, you can add rhythm. all coming from one idea and of course once you have it you can move one of the parts of it so you from any one idea you can start spinning off into into anywhere and you're right and it's all about taking that into practice not practicing to get something but allowing that practice to get to you and that's how I think you find your own style from 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 little bits of elemental music DNA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now our common story is, is going, is, is developing. So I worked, I was playing in a group uh, 12 years. Uh, it's a jazz and world music group, tango group. It was called, what well, is called still, Cuadro Nuevo. And we had projects together with an orchestra in Salzburg, Austria, and conductor Elisabeth Fuchs. So I knew her, and she asked me a few years ago if I uh, was willing up playing a, a concert program, solo harp, in a jazzy way, world music way, together with orchestra. And I said, yes, of course. And also I, I, um, I had a few own compositions uh, with nice is, uh, instrumentations, orchestrations. And she said, you know what? I discovered a piece in YouTube and I want to play this piece with you. We have to play this piece with, this with you. And this was Sonando in Espanol. It was Elizabeth Fuchs idea to play this with you, uh, with me. And this is your composition. And the, the third movement, of course, Baroque flamenco is very well known, but uh, also the, the first and the second movement, it's so touching. And I said, why not? It's a 22 minute piece. And um, so we, we uh, wanted to play a concert, but then there was COVID and it was not possible. So we recorded it. And you told me after this recording that it's the first time that uh, anybody recorded the whole thing on on a on a CD or whatever, yeah. Yeah, it's and the this first. Was also, we we met on 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 a computer. We had Zoom lessons and we talked about this, and it was so nice after another twenty years to meet you again and have an, another project together. And this was like the crown of the of the whole story for me, yeah. And now, but now we have the crown. Now, well, now we now we have the the beginning of the crown. Who knows what will come after this? But I mean, so this is the debut. What we're about to do is the debut of two harps and three powerful women. So it's meaning it's you, me, and and Elizabeth uh, Fuchs. Um, and what's so powerful about this is if you look back a hundred years, you might see a concert with a composer of a concerto, a performer who may have also be writing some of their music and a conductor, but you will never have seen three women in those positions. So for me, it's exciting not only to be playing with this symphony, which is amazing. The I listened to your recordings of these three pieces and they're, it's just so beautiful and so energetic. And I remember when I heard the tempo of the first one, I was like, oh my God, that's, that's what I dreamed it would sound like, but wow, it's just, wow, it was just so exciting. Um, but the, this, this idea of this could never have happened. There wouldn't have been electric harps. There wouldn't have been two women. There wouldn't have been one with this kind of harp and one with your kind of harp. This is the first time there's ever been anything like this. And just to also see historically, you know, that women would not have been able to do this a hundred years ago. I don't, maybe a hundred years ago, but definitely not like a hundred and 25 years ago. Well, I don't know, just making this stuff up. So I would, I have many more questions that I would love to ask you. And I know, I also just want to say something else, which is the second movement of the concerto came out of a project that I did with Kamak 
and the World Harp a Festival. And I know you and I are both very connected to Kamak, and Kamak was my collaborator on building this instrument. Um, Joël Garnier was the head of, of Kamak at the time, and he commissioned me to write a concerto. And the concerto that I wrote, um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was for two harps. And the middle movement was Merceditas. And the other two movements mm. were, were, yeah, the other two movements were fun, but they weren't, the, Mer Merceditas was the beautiful one. And at the time, it was not so built out as it is now. And I, I remember playing at the at the concert and I, I just love this piece so much. And I remember looking down at Joel Garnier and he was not happy with it. And I was like, I was so devastated. Well, the piece, I so I took the piece, I knew what it was supposed to sound like. So um if you listen to it now, it's 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 rich and it has a huge a lot of harp, a lot of harp arpeggios in it. At the time it didn't have as much. And so I took the piece back, I rewrote it. I wrote it for two harps and then I rewrote it for one harp. And so you're playing something that um, I really wish Joel could have heard. And it, and it came out of my relationship with Kamak and it came out of my, just my love for, it's the most romantic piece I've ever written, Mercedes. So it's gonna be very exciting for me to just hear you play that. And I get to just, I just get to stand there. <laughs> you can be next to me, yes. <laughs> I will be nervous. <laughs> You're next to me. <laughs> oh, I'm you I'm have to try. I want to tell you that nobody in the world could love your playing of this piece more than I do. So I you will enjoy. have someone next to you who loves what you are doing more and more deeply than anybody in the world could. Thank you. And I'm very glad that you talked about Joël Garnier because um, he was in my house. Uh, we, I did a, 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 there was a harp festival going on in Munich, which was uh, organized by my uh, former teacher, Helga Stork. And she invited also Kamak people and of course Joël Garnier. And there was this big party, harp party going on in my house. And he was in my house together with uh, Christina Braga and a lot of nice people uh, with um, David Botkins was also at this party. Yeah, so I, I knew Joel, but I'm, I'm very sad that he, he passed already, um, but I'm very happy about my col collaboration with Kama again. It's so nice to to have this um, parallel yeah. to your life too. Yeah, and it's really beautiful that we can celebrate our collaboration with Kamak in this concert and celebrate our collaboration with each other and celebrate our collaboration with the with the Philharmonic all all in one concert sounds like a big party that yes. night sounds like a party and the good thing is we have two nights yes that's right so if you have not already got your tickets and if you're listening to this please join us so you can be part of that collaboration part of that celebration and the, and the beginning of a new, um, a new part of this of this story, which is just so fascinating to go back and hear. So, Evelyn, thank you so much for for meeting me online. I know we have more questions, so maybe we can do this again. And it's just really been a pleasure to get to uh, to get to share this with you. And now I must figure out how to turn off the live, which I always forget how. But let me see here. <laughs> And if, let's see, okay, going to more, start, stop live stream. Okay, go forth, let's say this to everybody, go forth and harp on the magic in life. Bye. So bye. Oh, well now, so are you saying goodbye to me, Evelyn? Uh, to the audience. Oh, they're gone <laughs> now. But we can say goodbye, but we also recorded this. So we, <laughs> We also recorded this. Okay. Well, okay. So now I'm going to stop recording and everybody truly go forth and harp on the magic in life. And hopefully you will be harping on that with us in Salzburg on October 7th and 8th. And here we go. The end.